Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello, and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar covering QGIS for groundwater applications. I'm Cray, and I'm excited to be your host today and to introduce to you the expert presenters that you'll be hearing from. But let's start first with you, our attendees, who are coming to us from around the world. Looking at this map, it's always an awesome sight to see the global reach of any topic. But for today's topic in particular, there's been a tremendous response to this. And it really helps us, you know, seeing your response to these really helps us realize that we need to be doing more in this space. Whether it's QGIS or groundwater or the nexus of both of those, we do want to bring you more content that we'll get into here shortly. So as far as today's topic, we've got some experts on board board here for groundwater modeling, which to some of us is a bit of a dark art. You know, there's uh, sometimes surface water expression that comes out of the groundwater. Sometimes you can see it when it's sucked out of the ground, but while it's doing its thing in the ground, it's pretty much invisible to us. So being able to visualize it can be very helpful to someone like me who is used to seeing things on surface water. So this is a topic that I think is great where we're going to use some uh, free tools uh, in some of our courses to be able to assess the data get it into our software, and then be able to visualize it. And these are the experts who are going to help us do that today. So Kurt, Hans, Conrad, come on board here. Um, you can read their qualifications here, deep extensive qualifications that you see from each of these. Um, I won't go through that in detail, but do want to find out you know, where you're coming to us from today. And maybe we'll start with Kurt, who I understand last time he did a webinar for us, was coming to us from the US. Now this time you've managed to move overseas in the middle of a pandemic. Kurt, how did how did that go? Yeah, thanks, Craig. It went quite well. Yeah, I, I moved from the United States to Denmark in January, and I've started a new position with a great open source GIS company named Septima here in Denmark. Awesome. Hans, uh, where, where are you coming to us from, and what time is it uh, where you're at? It's already morning here in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, so uh, I'm close to Kurt uh, during this webinar. First time, I think, that we have a webinar uh, close together, so Good. looking forward to that. Yeah, we've usually tried to balance the, the three three corners of the globe when we get the three of us on board. But now we have Conrad as well. Just say good day. Where, where are you at these days? Hello, everyone. I'm in Perth at the moment in Australia. It's uh, early afternoon, just after lunch. Uh, it's great to be with you here, and I'm happy to help if there are any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. So Hans, Kurt, and Conrad have been part of our previous webinars as well. I do invite you to look some of those up. They're numbered on YouTube, on our, on our YouTube channel. I think there's number 69 was ModFlow, which again has over 10,000 views, along with our two QGIS webinars as well, number 84 and number 93. Have a look at those. Now, right from the start, I need to put out a disclaimer though. Um, in this one hour session, we're going to be able to touch on some of these awesome tools that will be available to you. But if you want to do this yourself and really dive into it and get into it hands Hands on sign up for the courses. And you see here a bit of a screenshot on some of the things that you'll be able to do with it. Starting just with Google, really, um, these courses are available to you on demand right now. You can go on online, sign up for them. We did them live and then we recorded them and all the content is available to you. You'll be able to start with Google and see that map there and with legends and line types and everything else, be able to do the delineation, You know, look at the 3D terrain and get a catchment map in QGIS and get your uh, groundwater model as well. So these courses are available for you. Do take advantage of that if you get a chance. And give us, again, your feedback at the end. When I moved to Australia, it's been over 10 years now, my first exposure to the Australian Water School was groundwater courses that they were offering. And I do get a bit nostalgic when I think of the live, real live classroom setting that we had back then. Lately, we've had a bit of a focus on, on surface water and flood modeling over the last year or two. Um, and, and it gets a lot of attention, but uh, we want to sway back uh, and get into the groundwater space here and uh, really explore that some more. So give us your feedback. What do you want to see more of in this space? If we have a look at those poll results before we turn it over, I wanted to see where everybody's coming to us from what's, which uh, industries. This is, I think, the first time ever that commercial consulting hasn't ruled. <laughs> in general, um, academic is, is there somewhere in second or third place. So we do have a lot in the academic space. Esri has come up as uh, one of the most popular ones, but this is a QGIS webinar. So as expected, it's coming out on top. One of the things I wanted to uh, just get from the audience here is you know, whether people who are attending have done the actual modeling or um, are we you know, mainly from the GIS space? And it looks like uh, less than half have actually done 
any groundwater modeling at all. So hopefully this will give you some of the tools to get into it. Some of the tools that um, are available to you are absolutely free, thanks to the taxpayers of the US government who fund things like uh, ModFlow and HECRAS and things like that. Looking at groundwater versus surface water and water quality versus water quantity, we've got all four of those listed here. Uh, it looks like groundwater quality has actually been getting more attention than groundwater quantity. Now today, again, we're talking groundwater quantity. If you wanna see more on the water quality side of things, do put that into the feedback at the end. So that's enough from me. Let's hear, uh, Conrad, uh, would anything surprise you as far as the uh, programs people have used for the modeling since you come from that background? Well, we probably free software, it lo it's looking good, I would say. Not only because it's free, but I believe that the quality is imp has improved definitely over years. I remember that for special analysis and, and mapping, I was using different software before, and now I move entirely to QGIS, and I'm very happy. Also, when it comes to groundwater modeling, my choices are often related with something that's affordable because it's there is a, lo a larger group of community group that supports it, and people support each other, and that's that's great to see yes. from from my personal point of view. Excellent. And what we want to give you here and give to the industry is resources that you can go to. If you've got free software, especially when it's government funded software, you might not have somebody you can call and you might need to get links to some of these resources where you can get in touch with the community of other users who have run into the same problem that you're running into all along the way. So again, from the name of my company, you can tell I'm a bit of an outsider here to the groundwater side of things, but I am excited to learn from our presenters today and really you know, get these things going on interaction. We've got groundwater people and surface water people, but we want to be uh, non-binary, if you will, here and promote that space in between the groundwater surface water interaction, because um, there is a lot of interaction between the two. And uh, the more the surface water modelers can take advantage of groundwater modeling and understand how that works and vice versa, the better off the industry will be as a whole. So we're going to start with Hans. If you can go ahead and start sharing your screen, Hans, with no further ado, let's kick off with some of the applications that you're going to use in QGIS. And then Kurt will follow on with the visualization. Over to you, Hans. Excited to hear from you. Thank you, Cray. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm Hans van der Quest. I work at the IHC Delft Institute for Water Education, and we do everything that has to do with water. So uh, completely non-binary surface water, groundwater management of water. We're located in the Netherlands, and I'm there a senior lecturer in GIS and spatial data management. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk you through the pre-processing and collecting of groundwater data using QGIS, but also where to find data. And when we talk about a workflow for pre-processing groundwater data, we first need to look for the data. We need data from boreholes, wells that we can use for our models later. Then we often want to build a database. There's spatial data, non-spatial data. We want to join the non-spatial data to the spatial data so it can be also used in a spatial sense. That can be, for example, groundwater quality or level data that is stored in separate uh, tables. Then we need to sample sometimes data from other sources at the location of those boreholes, uh, such as elevation, for example. Often we need to clean up the data. And for our models, uh, we need to interpolate the points to, uh, to rasters or to mesh or other formats, and then clip to the study area that we want to specifically look at for our case studies. And additional field data collection might be uh, needed. Then we want to do 2D visualization to interpret the landscape that we're looking at and 3D visualization. The last two components will be covered in uh, Kurt's presentation. I will focus on the data pre-processing part. So let's start with where to get the data. Well, I see that uh, from this uh, map that was shown by Cray that you come from all places all over the world. And if you look at global data, then it's uh, interesting to look at spatial data infrastructures that exist. Um, these are not just portals, they have uh, connections with GIS and applications. And an important one that you can uh, look at is this one from IGREC, the Global Groundwater Information System, where you can find a lot of uh, data from all over the world. But there are also local SDIs where you can get uh, data from your uh, country, hopefully if they have one. Otherwise, it's time to get started with one because it connects really to the data, to GIS and to modeling. And that's what I want to illustrate a little bit in the next uh, slides. So this is another uh, SDI from the SADC GMI, which has groundwater data for the uh, Southern African region. And you see that it has a nice web portal. It's based on GeoNode, which is open source software. And um, you see here this transboundary aquifers of the world layer. But the nice thing is it's not just a portal. We can have a real live link with QGIS. And you'll see that 
here demonstrated where we make a connection to GeoNode. That's the standard feature in QGIS. You can give it a name and then you just put the URL of, of the SDI, test the connection. And you see here that it supports WFS, which means vector layers, and it uh, supports WMS, which are rendered pictures of the data. So the connection works, so I can connect to the, the SDI. When the connection is established, I see here uh, all the data sets that are available with the type of web service that I can use. And I'm looking for this transboundary data set, the aquifers, and I choose their WFS. And then I simply get all the vectors in uh, QGIS that I can uh, further uh, edit. Uh, it has an attribute table. Uh, it's just as vector data that you're used to when you work uh, locally. Now, since uh, we're back here in a webinar for the Australian Water School, we zoom into to Australia. This is a, a national groundwater portal. It's the Australian Groundwater Explorer. And here you find a lot of borehole data uh, for Australia. And uh, we're going to look at this one. And at a specific case study where I'm going to apply this, uh, this workflow, uh, it's the Namoi River. And what we're going to try is to, to define a study area for the alluvial uh, aquifer, the shallow aquifer around this river. And if you go to the Australian Groundwater Explorer, you can uh, look for uh, rivers. So we do that, Namoi River. And you see that it supports different formats. It doesn't have this live link like GeoNode, which I demonstrated before, but we can download different formats. There is a ESRI file geodatabase, uh, but that's uh, not so easy to use for us. And uh, we would like to work with specific uh, data that we set up in our own uh, database. So we're going to make a geo package based on this shape file that we download. When we download that, uh, so it will send you an email that you can download it, and then it will give you access to these files. And it's always good practice to, in Windows, if you're a Windows user, to check this box file name extensions, because then you'll see that this is a CSV file, although it has an Excel icon and it says here it's a micro Excel, Microsoft Excel comma separated file. Well, it has nothing to do specifically with Excel. It's human readable text, which is stored in a CSV file. And you see that there are shape files, which you also understand, hopefully, that it's not just one file that belongs to one shape file, but it's a set of files. So we see here some different data. Another good practice advice is to always check the readme files that come with uh, these kind of downloaded data. And here we see that there are water levels in the CSV, some uh, water quality data, which we will not cover today, and that the shapefile contains the, the boreholes and there's some other data. So we're gonna combine all these separate files into a database. Uh, we use the geo package format to have really everything together in, uh, in one file. So we take here the, the shapefile uh, with um, the boreholes. We're going to export this from QGIS to the geo package, and we use the projection that was used with the shapefile. So that's the projection that we're going to use uh, in our project. So after exporting, we have our first uh, geo package, the database that we created, and we called it Namoi Groundwater Data. And if we expand uh, the bore data set, then we see all these attributes that we originally had in our shapefile also imported. We see that there are some reference elevation, that there are some, some ID codes there that we're going to use. Now, the other data sets, spatial and non-spatial, can also be dragged into that geo package that we created. So we really have everything together. It's a more efficient way of working with that data. So if the import was successful, then your geo package will look like this, uh, with this icon uh, showing that it's a non-spatial table. And then we have some points with boreholes, and we have some uh, line vectors with other information. We are interested in this uh, case study, of course, in the water levels in those boreholes. And the CSV with the water levels has a common column with the borehole data file, the hydro ID and the hydro code. And we are going to use this hydro ID to make a so-called join. So we take the non-spatial table and we join it with um, the point vector based on the hydro ID. and the water levels are stored in a field that is called result. So we can join that. We can also do that with other data that is provided, other non-spatial data, such as the hydro hydrogeologic unit. It also has the same uh, common field. The only thing is for this case study, it didn't contain information. So that's also something uh, you will experience that uh, this groundwater data, even if you have a whole set of points that some, uh, yeah, a lot of data is missing that you might need for your studies. Now, 
when we look at that attribute table of the boreholes, we see that the water levels at the boreholes from that data set were, were missing, but uh, we have that in a separate CSV file, so that's no problem. We just joined that. These water levels are the depth from a reference to the surface of the, the water in the borehole. So there's also a field which gives the elevation in meters with reference to the, to the datum. So it's an absolute elevation level. But we found in the data set that there are values around 200, 200, 300, but there's also a lot of value zero, which is a big difference with the other values. And in that way, I found out that that must be uh, no data. So the zeros have to be considered as no data and are not really zero meters. But yeah, it would be pity to throw out all those features which have uh, no data for the reference. So what we're going to do is to replace that reference elevation with the elevation from the DEM. And I know that we make a little error there because uh, that is not really the... Uh, the level at which the groundwater level measurement is taken, but we don't have any other data, so we add a little uncertainty there. But we need to get our elevation data uh, also from the internet. And for Australia, there's, uh, there's Elvis, still alive, and it gives us uh, elevation and, and depth in different formats. And we need to just define the search area and in latitude, longitude. So I use a tool in QGIS to get the uh, extent, extract layer extent. So I give the borehole data set as an input and it will extract the extent. And then I write it to the geo package. We store everything there and I need it in EPSG 4326, which is latitude longitude. And then in the layer information, I can here get the bounding box of the borehole layer and use that to search for DM data. Now there's a lot of DM data there, but it's in many small tiles and there's a limit to the size that you can use for downloading the data. So that's a bit of work. An alternative, but a bit coarser, is to use the SRTM downloader plugin, which will work everywhere in the world uh, between 60 north, 56 south, I think. And uh, you see that our area is covered with 18 tiles, which will uh, download with the plugin. And then the next step is to merge that into a virtual raster, so that will not create a real new big file out of 18 tiles, but it will create a little XML file that links them up together and contains all uh, metadata to, to have that uh, mosaic of the 18 tiles. And what we want to do with the DEM is to sample the elevation at the borehole data. We can use the sample raster values tool where we have as an input layer the, the boreholes, and then we have the DEM. It is good practice to reproject your DEM to the same projection as your borehole data, but this tool can handle it if they are different. It's not recommended, but it works. But you, just as a general rule, you are not always sure that the tool can handle different projections and in the back end will reproject them to the same to do the analysis. So good practice is first to reproject it. But in this case, it works. An alternative is to use the point sampling tool that is especially useful if you want to sample from multiple layers. But in this case, we use the sample raster values, which is a native tool in QGIS. And that will result in a new field where we see the DEM values here. And here are results that those were the water levels. And we see that those, that also has a lot of null values, a lot of missing data. So the next step is to clean up those missing values because we can't do much with that uh, because we're interested in the water level. So we can make this um, select features, select by expression, where we say if the result, which is our water levels, the depth from the reference to the water, uh, is not null, select them and export those selected features to a geo package. So we have a new layer which only contains uh, boreholes at which water level is known. Then the next cleanup action is that we want to correct those no data values, which are in fact the zeros in the TS ref elevation field. Because here you see it, the TS ref elevation, it has values in meters of the elevation of the, the reference height for measuring the water level, but it also has a lot of zeros. And those zeros are replaced with this case when function that's like an if then else, if the reference elevation equals zero, then replace them with the values in the DEM field, else use the TS ref elef value. And then we can finally calculate the uh, water elevation, which is the 
level of the water in the boreholes, the piezometric level in reference to, uh, to the data. And then the equation is quite simple. It's TS ref aleph minus the result. And that will give us water aleph, which will be a new field in the attribute table. Now, in this case study, we are interested in the alluvial aquifer. We can make a selection, of course, uh, based on the, the depth uh, of the, the water level. We can say all the shallow ones are, are probably the alluvial one. But if we look at the attributes, we can also see here the attribute F-type class, which gives different types of use of these boreholes. And here we can make an assumption that uh, the alluvial aquifer in this area is mostly used for irrigation. So what we are going to do is to narrow down our selection of boreholes by looking at only the irrigation ones, again with select by expression, and exporting that again to our geo package to keep everything together in one file. After that selection, we can do a spatial interpolation. We can, for example, use the IDW, inverse distance weighing. In QGIS there, you can access these interpolators through the menu, uh, but if you use the ones from the toolbox, you have a bit more options uh, from the processing toolbox to give the extent, otherwise it will just use the convex hull. And you can uh, specify the pixel size. So here I export it to 100 meter pixels. And then this is a result, but uh, I'm sure Kurt's going to present it in a more neat way than I do here. And another method of interpolation also often used in uh, groundwater analysis is uh, using decent polygons, which is called nearest neighbor analysis in uh, QGIS and has a similar uh, dialogue and that will result in a, a map like this. Now, we also want to have a real vector boundary of our study area. So we could use aquifer information if we have that, but we don't have it in this case. So uh, what we then assume is that the alluvial deposits are logically close to the river. So we can use the quick OSM plugin to download the waterway river tags from uh, OpenStreetMap. And from there, we can select Namoy River. And I also selected this river that is below, I forgot the name. So we retain only that part of the river data set from uh, OpenStreetMap. And then we want to create a buffer around it. And um, yeah, we already start modeling a bit uh, with assumptions. So I choose a buffer here of 10 kilometers. I use the buffer pro geoprocessing tool to create this buffer around the river. And then I want to preserve those boreholes that are within that buffer and discard the ones that are outside the buffer. And in that way, I can also clip the interpolation to that buffer around the river. So this will be our study area. Now, once we have defined our study area, we did all this pre-processing, we found out maybe that we uh, missed some data, we need to go out in the field, probably want to, uh, to map uh, springs, uh, wells, boreholes. We want to also create attributes if the springs are protected or unprotected, uh, maybe have some additional uh, depth values that we're uh, now missing, or water quality uh, parameters. Uh, I've seen that you're also, many of you are interested in water quality. In that case, it would be useful to create uh, an app for that, for surveying in the field. I mean, a mobile app. Uh, there are some great tools developed by Lutra Consulting, uh, the input app, where you can create in QGIS a field form that you synchronize through a cloud service called Mergin with your mobile phone. And then you can use your phone in the field to map uh, wells and take a picture and fill in the fields based on what you need. It will take the GPS locations of your uh, mobile phone, and then you can uh, use Mergent to synchronize it back with uh, QGIS. So this is quickly the workflow. You design your field form in QGIS and uh, all the map layers, all the, the GIS layers that you want to have on your mobile phone. You synchronize it with the Mergent plugin, and uh, you can also then monitor it in their cloud service. And then you have this project on your mobile phone ready for mapping features. And once you're back from the field, you synchronize back with the cloud service and you'll have all those data points in your QGIS project in maybe the same geo, data, uh, uh, geo package that you created for this project to uh, further explore or to use in uh, modeling. So 
that was all the content I wanted to present. If you're interested in, uh, for example, uh, creating a groundwater mapping app or other topics related to QGIS and uh, water, then uh, have a look at the GIS Open Courseware website at gsopencourseware.org, where you can find uh, free tutorials. And of course, at IHE, uh, we also offer uh, paid courses uh, with support and with certificates. And if you're interested, there's currently with uh, UNESCO a course running on uh, programming for geospatial hydrological applications. We have the same materials here in Open. GIS Open Courseware, but I'll share another link for that uh, where you can get a certificate until the end of uh, April if you uh, successfully complete the course. And it's an essential course on learning really from scratch how to use the command line GDAL and uh, programming in Python for uh, hydrological applications. So that was my presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to see how Kurt continues with that later uh, in the visualization part. Back to Cray. So, Kurt, if you want to start sharing your screen, um, we do have some Q&A time here just real quick to uh, maybe address a couple of the questions that have been upvoted the most. And it looks to me like most of the people, uh, the, the ones that got upvoted the most are people looking for data elsewhere. You, so Hans did a great job showing us how to get it for Australia. Um, but a lot of people are wondering, how do I get it for my own jurisdiction? So I'm going to back off here and uh, let uh, Kurt dive into it. Hans is now going to switch over and start answering those uh, with his fingers frantically typing. So, um, yeah, keep him keep him busy and keep calm red busy as well so thanks for those over to you kurt right. thanks Craig. so i'm going to pick up where hans left off and i'm going to talk about visualizing groundwater data in qgis i'm going to be walking through the steps that hans um, went through and, and kind of explain how we can uh, make that data look nice in, in qgis again just to introduce myself i work for a company named septima in copenhagen denmark and um just a, a quick shameless plug, Hans and I have a, a book related to this topic called QGIS for Hydrological Applications with Locate Press. And an, I've published another book on Discover QGIS 3X, and these are both available from Locate Press if you're interested in those. So launching into it, at the very outset, when I would start an analysis like this and I've added the boreholes to a map, what I'll often do is use this plugin in QGIS called Quick Map Services to add a base map just to make sure that the data is falling in the correct place. And so you can see here, I've added an open street map base map to this. And this plugin comes with over 150 base maps that you can use to quickly add to QGIS. Once that data is in there and it's, it's uh, falling in the correct place, um, I might want to begin to explore it a little bit by styling it. So here I'm turning on the layer styling panel, which you can use F7 to open up. It opens up a panel on the right-hand side. And I'm going to show the boreholes by type by using this categorized renderer against the F-type column and just choosing random colors. And um, a nice neat thing in Q is you can shuffle those random colors. If the first set of random colors is not pleasing to you, you can shuffle those around and then quickly see what all the different types of data are in this data set. Once we start working with the DEM, it's nice to be able to visualize that in ways other than just a black and white hill ramp. And so I'm gonna show you how to do a color hill shade and generate contours. And first, Hans was working with this in GCS, which worked fine for um, what he was using it for. But when we want to generate an accurate hillshade image, the DEM really should be in a Cartesian coordinate system. In other words, a projected coordinate system. So I can reproject the virtual raster by right-clicking on it, choosing Export and Save As. And I'm going to put this into the EPSG code, the projection of the other Australian borehole data, 3577 in this case, Australian Albers. And this basically puts the XYZ values of the DEM all in the same units. So once I have done that, I'm going to color this DEM. And so to do this, I'm going to, again, using the layer styling panel, choose single band pseudo color and choose a color ramp. And I'm going to um, create a new color ramp from this CPT city option in QGIS. And this is a set of color ramps that ship with QGIS and they're divided by category. So I can go in and find the topography category and find a nice color ramp. Um, I can also go into the min-max settings um, and choose how I want the values represented on the map. So here I'm gonna use the current canvas extent. And then finally I'll click classify. It's easy to forget that step and have a nice uh, color DEM from the min-max values on the visible extent. 
And once I've done that, I can um, use another rendering tool in QGIS. I'm going to duplicate the DEM. So I'm just making another copy of it here. And I'm going to name this copy Hillshade. I'm going to drag it above the DEM in the layer stack. And I'm going to return to the layer styling panel. And for this um, copy of the DEM, I'm going to render it as a Hillshade. And that's a nice quick render is available in QGIS. And then I'm going to use a multiply blending mode so that I will see the colors blended with the hill shade. And you get a really nice full saturated um, color hill shade effect. Um, I've also, um, when using this hill shade renderer, there's a section down below in the layer styling panel called resampling. And it's often um, helpful to play with the resampling settings here to get um, to eliminate a stair step in the result. So here I've um, chosen bilinear for both the zoomed in and zoomed out resampling for this hillshade renderer. And again, this is just really a nice quick way for you to render the DEM without having to actually generate a separate hillshade image. You're just rendering it as a hillshade. We can do something similar with contours. So I'm going to now make a a second copy of the DEM, and I'm going to name this one Contours, and I'm going to render the DEM as Contours. And so this, you'll see you pretty quickly, we'll have this DEM rendered in three ways, a colored DEM, a hill shade, and now Contours. This Contour renderer allows you to choose the Contour Interval. Here I'm going to stick with the default, but I can make the, the index contours a little thicker so that those are visible and change the blending mode to um, overlay to make them blend into the map a little bit. And so you get a really nice visualization of the, the contours and the topography of the study area that we're working in. I should note that there's also a contour, or there's actually several contour algorithms in the processing toolbox in QGIS that would allow you to create an actual contour vector layer, which would allow you to then label those contours as well. So there's, there's other options for doing this. This is the quickest way. So I've added the streams and of the area and the boreholes, and I'm going to just quickly show you how you can use an SVG marker um, to basically give a nice icon to these boreholes. So I'm choosing a, a kind of a blue SVG icon marker here and making it a little bigger so I can see where these boreholes are on the landscape a little bit better. So the SVG marker is one option for labeling points like this. And you can, you can find a variety of SVG icons um, for different um, borehole and, and uh, groundwater symbology sets. It's also possible to symbolize these, the final set of irrigation wells um, by the depth of water after the, after the analysis has been done that Hans showed you, I can use the graduated renderer against that water elevation column that he created um, and render those so that you see which wells have the biggest depth of water and which have the shallowest depth of water here. And you, so you can see the Biggest depth of water showing up in the southwest, southeast corner of the study area. Now that we have those points interpolated, we can also go in here and style the interpolated surface. So the, uh, in this case, the IDW. And so I'm simply changing it to single band pseudo color like I did with the DEM, choosing a nice blue color ramp for it, and then changing the opacity so that I can see the underlying hill shade a little bit through that. So this is what the data set ends up looking like. And you can see I've also labeled the, the points here for, for with the depth to water. So you can see how that corresponds to the interpolated surface and the coloring of the points. Now Han showed how to also interpolate using a thesis and polygon interpolation. And so here a similar styling has been applied to that interpolated surface. And you see the, the kind of the polygon look of the raster. And, um, you know, you, there's many ways to interpolate data, as Hans described, so it's kind of up to you to choose which one. But in terms of styling them, we can use basically the same method for any of the interpolated surfaces that are produced. 
now I've brought in the, the study area. And what I'm going to show you here how to do is create a, a mask around that study area to make it pop a little bit. So I'm changing, I'm actually going to let this reboot a little bit. And I'm changing from a single symbol here to an inverted polygon renderer, which renders the opposite of the study area. So everything around it. And that I'm going to use a shape burst fill to basically create a, a blend from dark gray to white outside the study area. I can set some of the shape burst settings here, like the blur strength to make it look a little bit nicer. And the final touch is to expand a layer rendering section and increase the opacity of this a little bit. So I see the area beyond the study area, but the study area itself really pops off the map. And I finish it off by adding one more symbol to the stack. And I'll make this extra symbol a simple line, which just gives a nice definition to the boundary of the study area. So very quickly, you can create this effect, which is called an inverted polygon shape burst fill to highlight a study area. Finally, it might be really nice to view these interpolated surfaces in 3D. So QGIS does come with a 3D viewer. And I can access that from the view menu, choose new 3D map view. And the map view will open as a, a new panel here. And I want to click the little wrench tool icon and choose configure to set up the 3D view initially. And here what I'm doing is setting it up as a DEM raster layer as the surface and choosing the IDW surface as the elevation and clicking OK. At that point, there's a series of controls off to the right, which allow you to manipulate this scene in 3D, tilt it, and then rotate it, uh, zoom in and zoom out. There are also tools in the 3D viewer for creating a, a, a 3D animation with keyframes. But you really, when you bring this into 3D, you really get to see on this IDW surface, the, the cones, the points where the, the water, depth to water is the highest there. If I bring the other interpolated surface in, you really see that stair-stepped effect uh, created by those kind of thesen, the, you know, basically what it amounts to, thesen polygons represented as a raster around the sampling points. So I already showed how to create contours for the DEM. You can use the same renderer on any raster. So here I've used the same contour renderer against a copy of the IDW surface and chosen contour interval of five and 25 for the index contours. And so we get a nice um, ISO lines around th this surface. So you can really um, visualize that data a little bit better. And to bring the whole thing home, we can bring this um, into a 3D scene and really have a nice view of that data. And you could do the same thing for the piece and polygon surface as well. So that's a, a quick show of what you can do for styling this kind of data in QGIS. And um, I can take any questions as we enter the Q&A period here. Excellent. Thanks, Kurt, for that. What you see, again, I want to want to stress and highlight for everybody uh, on, on the call is that, uh, boy, we blew through a lot of information there. And obviously, if, if you're, you're doing it yourself, what I've found in some of these courses is I have to stop, pause, follow along, and something that uh, somebody presents in 20 minutes might take me an hour or two to do on my own. But no frets. Um, if you, uh, you know, if the pace of this and you've got a lot of information uh, in front of you now um, is, is too fast, um, then sign up for the course and we'll make sure that everybody walks through all of the steps um, from beginning to end. A lot of people have asked the question, well, what if I have no experience whatsoever in QGIS? That's fine. Um, we give you some background materials. Those who are experienced uh, sometimes can just skip it and move ahead. But we assume that those starting the course uh, come with no background knowledge uh, in QGIS. Now, what, what we do want to make sure we've also highlighted, though, is that, that we're, we're showing you how to, how to visualize data. And a pretty picture can sometimes be just that. It can be a pretty wrong picture um, of the data. So getting that data and, and how you interpolate it and what, you, what, what assumptions you make as far as what happens in between the data points, that's going to be up to you. We had a few questions come in about the DEM data, and I, I guess 
one of the things I want to make sure that um, everybody's aware of is that um, if you just go take and download SRTM data, S for shuttle, meaning it's being flown from space, watch out. Those are flown um, and put out into the raster grids at uh, one arc second, so 1 60th of 1 60th of 1 degree, which ends up being about 30 meters. So sometimes you'll have some channel that, you know, that's five meters, 10 meters wide, taking SRTM data to try and find out what your ground elevation is at that point um, might not be sufficient. And what you'll need to do then, as you saw when Hans uh, showed you the download there, you know, at least in the Australian data set, maybe you need all 942 of those one meter grids and you have to put them together. It's not uncommon. I, I'll get I'll get data sets sent to me that are, you know, one file of, that's 20 gig just for one file. Uh, these days it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets you better and better data, but you got to make sure your hardware is keeping up with that. So those are the few of the questions that I saw on there that, um, that, that I've been hitting. Maybe let's uh, start with, uh, since we've just heard from Hans and Kurt, you'll uh, maybe share some of the ones that you've responded to uh, with the whole group, but let's hear from Conrad first. Anything you've seen in the background, Conrad, on the Q&A line um, that you wanted to, uh, uh, to to mention to the group? Yes, I think there are very, very interesting questions. You probably answered very well, introduced very well, uh, Cray. What we always have to remember, and in some of those questions, it popped up, that everything depends on the quality of data. Yeah, so it's like whether this is, it's not this just surface data, particularly when we are talking about groundwater, this is everything is hidden. No one, uh, unless we are at this at the spring, no one really sees groundwater. Uh, so the uncertainty related with this information is, is way bigger than the uh, uncertainty of the, of the surface. So we have to remember, and I think that in uh, Hans and Kurt presented very well the way how we can basically map and how we can process some of this information. But just bear in mind that the quality of, of your data set is crucial. So uh, there was lots of questions about where we can get data from. We Unfortunately, we don't... Uh, know much about uh, your country often. Sometimes uh, for our project, we actually prefer to collect our own data. We go to the field, we take our data, and then we, we know what we, what we have and what's the quality of this data. And this is what I would just would like to probably point at this moment. Thanks. Yeah, sounds good. So over to you. Let, maybe let's start with, with Hans, uh, or go, go over to Hans. The questions that you answered during Kurt's presentation, and then let's flip around. Um, what we want to focus on, I think, is those that got upvoted the most, because uh, that way, you know, if 12 people upvoted it, then that means uh, 12 people had that question. Um, so we want to make sure we hit those uh, first. I see at least 50 questions here, so we probably won't hit them all. So we need to be a little bit selective. So over to you, Hans. Yes, thank you. And I think uh, the, most of the questions are a continuation also of, uh, of Conrad's uh, discussion uh, on the data quality. So I would like to, to handle a big chunk of questions that relate to, to that. So first of all, for, uh, for elevation data, uh, what we see also more and more, if you want really detailed elevation data, is uh, the use of uh, stereophotogrammetry with drones. So there's a nice new course on gisopencourseware.org to use Web ODM, which is open source to extract point clouds, and then you can really make uh, accurate uh, DEMs if you also have uh, good GPS data. Um, and it's always surprising that uh, in, in these international webinars, uh, people ask us how to find data in your country. I still find that very surprising. So I think there's a lot of effort you need to do on your side with your governments and with your tax money to get uh, the data that you need collected yeah, And if you are watching and you work for such a government and you are having a mandate to collect that data, you see what we can do, what we have data, we can process it and use it in our models. Now, related to that, there's also a set of questions about interpolations and assumptions, which is important to address. So we've showed uh, TSEM polygons. That is very commonly used in, in groundwater modeling and also in, in hydrology if you have no other assumptions and you have a sparse point data set. So basically it says the location that you don't know has the same value as the location that you know that's nearest neighbor. 
that most people like to look at uh, IDW because it nicely smooths out uh, the, uh, the data. And if you have sparse points, you will see artifacts in your interpolation. You see, as you could also see here, you see that there's mountains around the points or valleys around the points when they are low because it uses an exponential decay function in the interpolation uh, as a weight with the distance to the point. Now, many people have learned in, uh, in university about creaking are all very cool and sophisticated, but if you have uh, as less point density as we have here, cridging doesn't make any sense. For cridging, you need point pairs to construct a semi-variogram, and you use that semi-variogram to interpolate, and uh, it, it's based on, uh, on spatial autocorrelation. Then there are several questions about the assumptions of 10 kilometers uh, for the buffer. This, again, is up to you as a modeler. A model, you should know as a, as a modeler that you need to make assumptions. So here, I just made an assumption uh, by measuring my my points and looking at the points and how far they're from the river and my knowledge from this kind of river. So I thought 10 kilometers might be a good way to separate the ones that are further away and that are closer by. But you need field studies or you need geological maps or geomorphological maps to find out where that flat plain is or use land use as a proxy. So with modeling, there are all kinds of assumptions and this, uh, especially with groundwater, because it's so invisible, we need to add a lot of assumptions while we are processing the data and interpolating. And as Conrad said, the uncertainties in the whole process of modeling and uh, it is much larger than, uh, than your uncertainty on the DEM from SRTM, for example. Although I agree with Cray that uh, the more precise you get that, uh, the better. But yeah, be aware that along the whole processing chain, there are so many uncertainties added that uh, if you have nothing else than SRTM, just use that. Um, okay, so yeah, Kurt, um, over to you. Anything that you, uh, you, you were frantically answering uh, questions there during Hans's part, um, any that you wanted to highlight? Uh, no, I think Hans covered them. Most of the questions I saw around Hans' presentation had to do with the interpolation. And um, I guess one thing that Hans didn't talk about was um, that was kind of interesting is questions about determining the accuracy of um, an interpolation. So I don't know, Hans, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, the best thing is to have ground measurements, uh, of course, and you can uh, split uh, your sample of boreholes, uh, the ones with the data uh, that you use for the interpolation and another uh, set that you use to verify uh, the interpolation. I don't know, Conrad, maybe you have more experience with uh, validation. Well, it's uh, it's just pure mathematics. So it's uh, I I I think that obviously interpolation will be always some kind of interpret mathematical interpretation of of the observations. So it's uh, I I actually don't have basically what you said, Hans. It's 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 correct uh, about uh, cridging. It's uh, sometimes we do, but very rarely because we don't have enough enough data so we have to choose a method that it's most it's a it's a bit like uh, hydrological uh, intuition what's what we feel is the best and if other people agree with this the reviewers of your project the supervisors then it's uh, normally accepted uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's it's good to see what other people do and apply the same uh, the same methodology, but basically the common sense applies here. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Um, and I think um, if you, well, let me just uh, share my screen real quick um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just show you some, um, an application here. When we talk about the SRTM data, this is just something I wanted to share and then I'll show you something about the, the TSIN polygons. This one right here that you see, this is an application and um, I'll put a link in the chat line here where I've downloaded DEM data, one from the SRTM and then another one from uh, the one meter grid uh, data that's actually publicly available from NOAA. And I've got links to those as well. This is the LA River, and you've seen that little low flow channel where in Greece people will go up and down that uh, that channel uh, racing. You can see that low flow channel in there in the one meter data. Look at the SRTM data. So if you had a point up here, you know you could be way off, 10, 20 meters off. The next thing that I wanted to share then just based on the TSIN polygon questions that came up, um, yes, this is for everything, for um, hydrology, for hydraulics, and, and many, many applications even outside of water resources for interpolation. This is just out of the HECRAS manual, um, and you can see some things about 
about T's and polygons in here and how you might take precip data and move it around. Uh, and look, this looks very similar to what uh, some of the grids are that, um, uh, that Hans and Kurt were talking about. If you also look at, I think, computational grid, we can see that there's many applications, like for example, in ECRAS, when you draw a grid line, all you're doing, again, taking these grid points and going halfway in between, drawing a perpendicular line, uh, you know, many, many applications for this. So I'll stop my share with that. But those questions did come up. Hey, what can you use TSM polygons for and how accurate is it? This is something that is dealt with across a number of uh, industries. Let's see. Let's go to just, yeah, any last comments, but let's back up and just go in reverse order again from what we just did. Have Conrad, then Hans, then Kirk, just uh, wrap up with any final comments based on questions you've seen or anything that you want to share uh, before maybe we interact with you again on another webinar or we get back to the attendees again in a course uh, and interact with you live in that form formats um, in a live workshop where you get to do exactly what you saw Kurt and Hans just do, you get to do it yourself. So uh, Conrad, any closing remarks for today? Well, it has been terrific to listen to, to Hans and, and Kurt. I also learned lots of things and, and wonderful that so many people listen to us. I think that your interest about groundwater and the application is excellent and it's uh, and I admire this. And thanks very much for your presentation, guys, but also for your attention. Okay. That's, that has been terrific. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Hans, uh, closing remarks. Yes, uh, thanks also. I appreciate so many people interested in uh, in this uh, session. And um, all I just want to say is, um, yeah, use common sense when you use data. Uh, place yourself into the modeler's perspective and uh, yeah, don't don't be disappointed if the highest resolution uh, is not available. Uh, uh, use your assumptions and, and make the right decisions there. Sounds good. Over to you, Kurt. Yeah, I'll just echo what Hans just said. Uh, you know, you may have to actually collect your own data if, if something doesn't exist. So that that's always that's why Hans was showing the uh, input and merge in tools. Um, I think um, I'm just really uh, excited about the number of participants we got for this. So thanks for everyone for tuning in from around the world at whatever time it is for you. And we hope we see you in the course coming up. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks to all the presenters, the panelists. Let us know what you'd like to hear. A lot of times we show you how to do things, but maybe we could get some more content on there on whether the data is correct. Um, do we have correct data in there? So we're, we're taking these groundwater points and we're saying, um, okay, well, have a look at that. We put them into a map, but you know, maybe they're taken at different seasons. Maybe they're taken from perched aquifers. You know, Maybe we need to understand a bit more about the groundwater hydrology and, and get into some of the concepts like you would have in a university course. These are the things that... Um, now in our online world, interconnected world, we want to make sure we're giving you the most relevant content uh, and giving you the information that the industry needs right now um, to be able to continue uh, improving even when we can't meet face-to-face -face, uh, sometimes at the moment. So have a look at the screen here. These are some of the courses that are available, but the offerings are as uh, can be, we can get as creative as uh, the input from you on your feedback forms. So do fill those out. Let us know. Subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, and uh, to the Australian Water School subscription list so that you will hear about future webinars. Thanks so much for your attendance. Thanks to Hans, Kurt, and Conrad for attending today and presenting and sharing that information with us. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water. Visit the AustralianWaterSchool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.